Look at verse 1. O Lord, thou art my God. That's enough right there. <laughs> yeah, that's enough right there. That's, that's it. Thou art my God. Hey, I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name. For thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and true. That's the best advice to give any pastor, any preacher, anybody who's in the ministry. Give it to any Christian. There's two things you need to know. Just be faithful and be true. Be faithful and be true. Hey, it's the hardest thing to be faithful sometimes. Times, you know, get rough and down and out. It's just like we're having this morning. Sometimes you come to church, you're like, man, I just, I'm just tired and worn out. Had a long week. It's 100 degrees outside. You get in this cold building, it's easy just to unwind. But if there's any time we need to be excited, it's when we come in to serve and to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Be faithful and true. That's the counsels of old from our Lord God that says, Thou art my God. What kind of God is my God? Look at verse 4. For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. That's all our things our God does right there. If you're poor, he's going to give you strength. If you're in distress, he'll give you strength. If you're, if you're in a storm in life, he'll give you a refuge. God is all of that. That's my God. Yeah. Thou art my God. Now skip back down to verse 8. He will swallow up death and victory. Well, that sounds familiar. That's what Paul quoted in 1 Corinthians 15. That death will be swallowed up in victory. Our God's going to swallow death up in victory. Just recently we had a dear beloved missionary, love him to death, Brother Eubanks, passed away over in Africa. The world's going to miss him. The world don't know it. But the world's going to miss that, miss that man, Brother Eubanks. And I'm missing him already. But the Lord swallowed up that death in victory. Because he got the victory. First thing Brother Ronnie Hoggett said to me when he walked in the back doors, when he knew I knew that Brother Eubanks passed away, the very first thing Brother Ronnie said to me, well, he got what he wanted. Talking about Brother Bill. He got what he wanted. And I knew what he meant. And I, he, knew what I would, he knew I'd know what he meant. What he meant was every time I was around Brother Bill, if you are around Brother Bill very long at all, he got to talking about his ministry over in Africa, he would say, I want to die over there serving the Lord. I don't want to be over here in America. I want to be over in, over in Africa serving Jesus Christ, and I want the Lord just to take me where well, the Lord took him. That's a prayer answered. He will swallow up death and victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. Amen. That's our God. He's going to wipe away the tears. He's going to swallow up death and victory. That's the God we're talking about. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. Talking about the Jew. For the Lord has spoken it. Now this chapter is talking about the millennial reign. When Jesus Christ comes back as King of kings and Lord of lords. When Jesus Christ comes back as God manifest in the flesh. When he comes back, this is what the Jew is going to say. These are all the things that the Lord is going to do. And, the, and this is prophecy about that time and when it comes. And I want to focus on verse 9 this morning. On verse 9 is where I want to focus. And it shall be said in that day. Lo, this is our God. Mm. Lo, this is our God. We've waited for him. He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. I want to preach this sermon this morning on this is our God. This is our God. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you humbly, Lord God. And I pray, your Father, your Holy Spirit will lead God and direct us. Move among us, Lord God. Wake us up, Father. We know, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is a quickening power, Lord God, that he will quicken us and make us alive, Lord God, and bring us into rejoicing and gladness, Lord God. And we do rejoice and are glad in your salvation you give us, Father. And Lord, I pray, Father, that you would speak to every heart in here, Lord God. Every heart underneath the sound of my voice, Father, that if they don't know Jesus Christ, they don't know what God they're serving, Lord, that they realize it and start serving you, Lord God. And we can honestly say, Lord, in this church, that you're our God. And we're so proud of you, Lord God. We're proud to have you as our God. We're so happy and rejoicing to have you as our God, Lord. There's no other God but you, Lord. 
And we thank you, Lord God. We thank you for being the kind of God that shows grace and mercy and comfort and forgiveness, Lord. Thank you for being that way. You don't have to be that way, Lord, but you are, and we thank you for it. In Jesus Christ, holy name I pray, amen. amen. This is our God. This is our God. Lo, this is our God. It's like he's come through the back door and he goes, hey, there he is. That's my God, verse 1. That's our God. That's our God. I have a friend who has a young son, and he was talking to his young son about God, about going to church. His young, said, young son, this is what he said. His young 13-year-old son said, I don't believe in God. I believe in science. He's made God his science. He doesn't realize that science is God. God created all these laws, mathematical laws. God created the mathematic laws. God created this universe. God created science. So when you're studying science, you're, true science, you're studying God. And if you talk to a scientist or talk to a lot of people in the world, they'll say their God is science. I, don't believe, I believe in science, but I don't believe in the Bible. I don't believe in Christianity. I don't believe in your God. I've got my God and my God is science. And they'll hold up a science book. Just like I hold up a Bible. I hold up a Bible and say, this is my God. The God of Jehovah. Jehovah God, the God of this Bible, that's my God. And they'll hold up a science Bible, a book, and they'll say, this is my God. I can believe in this God. I can prove this God. I can, I can prove to you scientifically in my God of science. And to me, that's a scary thing. And if they ask us why we believe in God Jehovah, why we believe that this is our God, the Lord God Jesus Christ, a lot of us will say, well, it's a testimony in my heart, and it's from this book. Amen. And their answer to that every time is this. Well, that book is written nothing. That book was written by men. That book is written by men. And my answer back to them is, that science book you're holding up in your hand is written by men too. We're in the same boat. What boat is that? That boat's called faith. You're believing in something, and I'm believing in something. Somebody's fooled you. Sir Arthur Keith. That's what he had to say. Now, Sir Arthur Keith, who is this? Sir Arthur Keith is a man that wrote the, on the 100-year anniversary of Charles Darwin's book of, uh, uh, of uh, Darwinism, Origin of Species, he wrote the foreword. So this guy's an evolutionist. He's really high in the field. He wrote the foreword to the 100-year anniversary to the book. This is what he said. This is what Sir Arthur Keith said. Evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it only because the only alternative is special creation, special creation, which is what we teach as Bible believers, and that is unproved. Thankable. What's he saying? We believe it because the other option of believing God, we don't want to believe that. It's unprovable and unproven. He admits it. The professor over in France of biology, this is what he said. Evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups. That's what he said. This is the evolutionary. These are, these are, these are not Christians. These are your people. The people that wrote that book you like to hold up, the science book you like to hold up, this is what they said. Evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups. This theory has helped nothing in the progress of science. It is useless. This isn't Christians saying this. These are evolutionary scientists. Your own people that you want to bow down to and worship and say, oh, I believe everything they say. These are the same people that believe everything the government says. As long as the person they like is in government. Amen? When Trump was in government, running the pre when Trump was president, oh, the government's wonderful. God bless America had the flags. As soon as Biden comes in, we don't believe anything the government does. They're all out to get us. Flip-flop, right? Those same people that hated Trump, oh, the government's out to get us, hate Trump, and as soon as Biden got in, oh, we should listen to everything the government says. Is your God this government? Is your God politics? Is your God science? I got this book at home. To, it's called That Their Words May Be Used Against Them. 
You see how thick it is. It's, what it is is quotes from evolutionary scientists, from non-believers that don't believe in Christianity, that help creationists. In other words, it, it helps, it condemns what they believe. It's pretty amazing. I'll, I'll just read one of them in here. And it says, in the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions, all these supposed missing links. In general, these have not been found, yet the optimism has died hard, and some pure fantasy has crept into the textbooks. Your Bible's written by nothing but men. Well, your book is too. And my point to you is, I'm believing this book that's written by men, and you're believing a book that's written by men. You're putting faith in men, and I'm putting faith in man. But see, what the difference is, I believe that man was moved by God to write this book. Inspired. God breathed on this book. Why do you, and how do you prove that? Prophecy. Because everything he said in this book has come to pass. It's pretty amazing. When I look at a science book, they keep changing it up and changing it up and changing it up. 400 million years ago, there was a soup and a primordial little thing come out of here. And then what do they say? Now it's 400 billion years ago. They keep just sprinkling time on it thinking it'll get better and better, and it doesn't. It's all a fantasy. What do you want to believe? This is my God. This is my God. This is our God. This is the God of the, the Bible. I got a question for you, and I want to ask you something. If you're underneath the sound of my voice, you need to pick your God. You've got a God, you need to pick him. I just read it to you, and I think a lot of Christians in here would say the same thing. This is my God. See Jesus Christ up there? That's mine. That's the one I pick right there. This is our God. Lo, this is our God. I love it. Verse 9. Lo, this is our God. We've waited for him. We're waiting on him. You need to pick. You need to take sides. Look at Joshua chapter 24. Look at Joshua chapter 24. If you want to follow along with me, I'm going to, I'm going to read you a couple of verses outside of these verses. Joshua chapter 24, real famous set of verse. Verse 15, Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. A lot of people know this verse by heart, the end of it at least. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. Take a side, pick one. Pick a God. I can already hear the atheist. I, I've already heard them say it to my face. I don't, I don't, uh, they'll say, I don't have no God. I don't believe in God. I don't have to pick a God because I don't believe in God. Well, yeah, you just did pick a God. You picked your own mind to be a God. You're saying your brain is God. You're saying your brain is God that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt if you went into all the far reaches of the universe, you would not find a creator, you would not find a being that you could call God. If you went out, you're saying no. That says you're saying your, your mind is God. You're going to have a God one way or another. You get what I'm saying? You have a God. Look at 24 verse 15. Joshua, Joshua chapter 24 verse 15. Joshua says to the people of Israel, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, and maybe it does. Maybe you say, it seems evil to be a Christian. It seems evil to serve the Lord. It seems, this God, Jehovah, that you talk about, I think he's evil. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, then choose you this day whom you will serve. If this is not your God, then pick a God. Go ahead. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood... Or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. He said, pick one of them. You're going to pick one of them, pick one of them. But as for, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. The world has their gods. They set up their gods. They set it up. And I'm here to tell you in Isaiah 25, this is my God. This is our God. This is the Lord God, Jesus Christ. Pick your God. Look at 1 Kings chapter 18. Make a decision. You know what? The, there's, there's nothing worse than a man who skips around with teams, football teams. I call them, I call them rats. Just like New England Patriots. 
there for years. You, everybody had, you couldn't find a guy. The, every, all these guys, they had their New England Patriot hats on. They had their New England Patriot stickers on the truck. Now that Brady's left and the New England Patriots are no good, guess what? I, I'm a Tampa Bay Buccaneer fan. Wee! They just pick whatever team's winning. I think that's evil. I've always been a Dallas Cowboy fan, always going to be a Dallas Cowboy fan. I'm not going to change. Go through all the bad. Been through the, all the bad. You know what happens when you go through the bad? Go through all the bad, you appreciate the good. Bunch of uh, rats jumping off one ship to go on to another. Look at 1 first, first Kings chapter 18, verse 21. This is what Elijah said to him. And Elijah came unto all the people, talking about Israel, and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the pe people answer him not a word. <laughs> That's what I'm telling you this morning, what Elijah said to you and what Joshua said. Hey, you got to pick a God. Just pick one. If government's your God, then that's your God. If Muhammad's your God, Allah, that's your God. If the Hindu God, Buddha, money, job, sex, drugs, whatever's your God, alcohol, let that be your God. But as for me, my God is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, that's my God. That's my God. His name's the Lord. Isaiah 25, 9, and it shall be in that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We've waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Yeah. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. When I say our God, I think I'm speaking for a lot of Christians in, the, in this room right here, and a lot of brothers and sisters gone on to be with the Lord. If I had Sister Alice Martin up here with me, and Brother Eubanks up here with me, we could put our arms around each other and, and look at the Lord Jesus Christ and say, this is our God. I can stand arm in arm with a bunch of you Christians out there this morning, arm in arm, hugging and say, this is our God. Praise the Lord. There's millions of Christians who would stand up today and say, Jesus Christ, this is my God. This is our God. He's the Lord. It's His salvation. But what's amazing about this God, the Lord Jesus Christ is, he wants a personal relationship with each and every one of you. Even though millions can say, that's my God, Jesus Christ says, I'm your God and I want to make it a personal God. I want you to pray to me. Talk to me out loud. Talk to me like you were my friend. My wife and I were riding to church this morning. We were talking about prayer. We always get to talking about the Lord, talking about prayer and she was talking about, she said, sometimes I just pray like a little kid. I, and I was thinking, I do too. Just, Father, I really want this. Can I have it? <laughs> What's wrong with that? Nothing. That's how God wants to talk to you. That's how God wants you to talk to him. God wants you to have that childlike faith. That's our God. Have you got your God picked? I've got my God picked, so let's compare them. Let's say, let's compare, let's do a comparison test of the gods. My God loves me even though I'm a sinner. My God loves me while I hated him. That's my God. How about yours? Will your God love you when you don't love him? My God, see that cross up there? There's a cross up there. See that man hanging on that cross? His name's Jesus Christ. That's my God. And he's hanging up there for me and for you. And he's dying up there for nothing he did. He was innocent. What's he dying up there for then? He's dying up there for the sins of the world. That's my God. How about yours? Has your God ever died for you? Has your God ever done anything for you? What has your God done for you? Muhammad, what did Muhammad do for anybody? Honest question, I'm not trying to offend you. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. I'm not trying to get you mad at me and come blow up my church. I'm trying to ask you a simple question. What has Muhammad done for you? Where is your redemption? Where is your forgiveness? 
My Jesus Christ, my God, has done it all for me. You see why I love him? Lo, this is my God. Right there, coming up there. This is my God. You know what that says? You're proud of him. You're happy about him. Say, this is my wife. I want to introduce you to my wife. Or this is my son. We introduce the people we love. That's the way it is. Here comes the God. Here comes this man. He goes, there's my God right there. Lo, there's my God right there. If I could take you and bring you down to Jerusalem and show you that empty tomb, I would say, see this empty tomb right here? It's empty because my God's not here. He's gone. He's alive. He's risen. How about your God? <laughs> Amen. Last I heard, Muhammad's still dead. Just the truth, right? We're all about the truth. Amen. Truth. Let's just get the truth out there. Is Buddha dead? Long dead. Is Muhammad dead? Long been dead. A lot of these gods that people serve and worship, they're dead. My God, he's alive. That's why I can say, lo, there's my God, because here he comes. We're waiting for him. We're waiting for him. Lo, it shall be said in that day, lo, this is our God. We've waited for him. I like that. You know why you wait on somebody? Because you love them. You wait on somebody because you love them. And you want to see them. And they got something for you and you got something for them. Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We've waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. How do you know the Lord's going to come back? How, you're waiting on him, and I am waiting on him. How do you know the Lord's going to come back? I know the Lord's going to come back because in the end of verse 8 it says, For the Lord hath spoken it. See that right there? I know it because the Lord, the Lord writes it down. He speaks it. Through men, men wrote it down in this book, and everything's been happening just like this book said it happened. Except for one last thing. There's a temple that needs to be rebuilt in Jerusalem, and Jesus Christ needs to come back. And I'm waiting on him. Most Christians in here, at one time or another, I've heard y'all in this, on this church say, I can't wait for the Lord to come back. I'm just looking for Jesus Christ to come back. As this world gets more wicked and more wicked and evil, and the world's just falling apart all around us. Christians are, are stopping looking at the world. For Finally, we're stopping looking at the world. We're going, okay, I'm looking up. There's my God, and I'm waiting on him. Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. Amen. He will save us. Can your God save you? Science? I, I'll be honest with you, whenever the doctors do anything for anybody in this church, I praise the Lord for the wisdom he gives the doctors to do that. And it's amazing how, like, Sister uh, Linda gave the testimony Wednesday night that her doctor was saying, you know what, it was prayer. It wasn't me, it was prayer. It was, there was something going on. It was a miracle, what I was doing to you and how you came through it. This is the doctor that doesn't have to say that. You hear what I'm saying? The doctors realize... They're, they put their pants on just like you. They put their shoes on just like you. They're just like me and you. That's why, that's why older people don't like going to the doctor. Because the older you get, you go to the doctor, it's like, this little punk, not those punks, going to tell me what to do. <laughs> I've got grandkids as old as this guy. And he's over there, I'm going to help you. No, no, you're going to help me. That's a, the, scary, the most fear I've ever had in my life. The biggest fear I've had in my life. I got onto an airplane in Abilene, Texas. One of the first times I ever flew, I got on this airplane in Abilene, Texas. It's one of those little bitty, I don't know, I don't say Cessna, but it was this little bitty plane. There were like two seats on each aisle. Little bitty, you know, it had like propeller things. And I'm like, what is this? This is like the 50s, but it's in Abilene. So I get on, here comes the pilot. He looked like he was 19. Don't have to shave, but like twice, you know, once every week or something like that. Gets on there. 
And he's like all proud and everything. And I asked the stewardess, I said, is that the pilot? She said, yes. And I'm thinking, oh, my Lord. Oh, no. I don't know about you, but I want the old grizzly veteran. I would love it. He came in and had a stogie sitting out of the side of his mouth. Looked like he'd flown in Vietnam, missing one eye, whatever. Had Charlie try to shoot him down. That's the guy I want flying for me. Not the 19-year-old kid. Amen. Amen. Lo, this is our God. I want to close out by saying this. Do you want to meet him? This is my God. This is our God. But do you want to meet him? See, when you read these, this verse here in verse 9, this implies that you're telling somebody, you're pointing them out. Hey, this is our God right there. This is my God. Lo, lo, hey, hey, that's my God. Do you want to meet him? See, this is not a God that's not approachable. This is not a God that doesn't want to get to know you. This is a God that wants to save you. Amen. Amen. This is a God that loves you and wants to do something for you. How do I get to meet him? Well, if you'll come with the right heart knowing you're a sinner. With the right heart believing that he died on the cross for your sins. With the right heart in your heart knowing that he rose again on the third day. You got to believe in his death, his burial, and resurrection. Why is it so important to believe in his resurrection? Because you're about to pray with all your heart to a God that you got to know is alive. And when you have that heart, you say, I. He can hear me and he will save me. That's my God. When you're praying to Muhammad or Buddha, you're praying to somebody who's dead. When you're praying to Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, you're praying to somebody who could walk in those back doors right now. And if he was to walk in those back doors, I pray and plead that you'd be able to stand up and turn around and say, Lo, this is our God. We've been waiting on him. Lo, he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is our God. Yes, it is. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. Thank you for these people, Lord God, that love you and that want to come out and, and, and hear from you, Lord. And I pray, Father, your Holy Spirit will speak to the hearts of truth that they need this morning, Father. And Lord, I know if they need you, You've already been speaking to their heart, Lord. And I pray, Father, you'd make it real to them, Lord God, that they would uh, get down, Lord God, and, and, and confess their sins, Lord God, and know that they're a sinner, Lord, and ask you to save them, Lord. That's what I did. I just simple by, by simple faith, Lord God, just called out to you and said, Lord, I don't want to go to hell. I want to be saved. Please save me, Lord. And you saved me. And I thank you for that, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that we can this morning say, that's my God, that's our God. And all the strength and all the things you did for us that we read, Lord God, you've done all those things. You're a refuge in a storm, Lord God. As the storms of my life have happened, Lord God, you've been right there with me the whole time, and I can't thank you enough. Thank you for giving me an abundant life, Lord. I thank you for these people. And if somebody needs to get saved, Lord, I pray that they'll bow their head, Lord God, and ask you to save them. In Jesus Christ's holy name I pray, amen. All right, let's have an invitation, brother. This is our God. Our God.